Hello and welcome everybody to the sixth episode of Social Europe Talk. My name is Henning Meyer, Editor-in-Chief of Social Europe. Today's episode is brought to you in cooperation with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation and we are going to talk about the Eurozone and Eurozone reform. And I'm uh, very happy to have three brilliant panelists here with me. I'll start from left to right. Uh, on the left we have Jakob von Weizsäcker, an MEP from Germany and also an economist. We have Maria Joao Rodriguez former um, uh, minister in Portugal, but also vice president of the S&D group in the European Parliament, and an economist as well, and I should say president of FEPS, a think tank here in Brussels. And last but not least, the third economist in the round and former EU commissioner, Laszlo Andor from Hungary. So uh, let's get going, Maria, if I, if I can address the first question to you. Uh, this year marks the 10th anniversary of the financial crisis that then led to a Eurozone uh, crisis. If you look at the developments of the past 10 years, uh, what has been achieved? What were the primary problems of the Eurozone 10 years ago and what has been achieved to rectify these problems? Well, I would say that so far too little too late. Mm -hmm. uh, what was achieved was to create uh, a new instrument which is now called the European Stability Mechanism. And this was created where we were really close to the abyss with the, the Greek re, uh, crisis and other member states joining this crisis. And uh, this remains an uh, instrument to deal with the sovereign debt uh, cases uh, by advancing quite hard uh, adjustment programs. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the other hand, there were some uh, steps taken when building up a banking union, but we are halfway of this. Mm -hmm. And when it comes the other important pillar of a complete economic and monetary union, which is the fiscal pillar, we are no way. Eh? So uh, we are, in fact, dealing with uh, proposals which are now on the table. And I believe that we should use these last months really to get uh, a first agreement. Otherwise, we repeat the mistake we have done uh, in 2014, when we had already good plans on the table, and they were just simply lost because there were no political conditions to come up with a, an agreement, uh, including uh, when it comes the German government and the French one. Okay, and so you said too little too late, but some steps have been made. Uh, Laszlo, if I may come to you, you've been one very vocal proponent of a European unemployment insurance scheme. Uh, now we have plans for a European unemployment reinsurance scheme. Uh, can you explain sort of the differences and what the advantages of such a scheme would be? Um, also in order, you know, what would it do to help stabilize the Eurozone? Yes, I think it was understood by many quite early during the crisis that there is a systemic problem in Europe. There's also a systemic problem in the world, a, a global failure of uh, the capitalist business model, uh, which was very under-regulated uh, internationally. Uh, but definitely in Europe we have been facing the problem that the monetary union was incomplete and very important components missing, especially what is about risk sharing uh, between different countries um, which might be financially stronger or weaker, and also the connection between the economic and monetary and the social dimensions have also been missing. Unemployment insurance or reinsurance is a possible tool to address the imbalances, the risk of divergence, but at the same time ensure that there is also development on the social dimension, on the social side of um, the integration. I think it's not that hard to understand. The point is that um, there can be so-called asymmetric shocks. One country can be hit much more by an economic downturn, a financial crisis, uh, some kind of external uh, effect uh, than others, resulting in a sharp rise of unemployment. But in a monetary union, which is also very strongly coordinated fiscally, the member states are not really autonomous to deal with these problems. The many of the governments find that their hands are tied as compared to the earlier times where they could print money or devalue the currency in order to ease uh, this situation. So, if there is solidarity in the system, and there must be solidarity in the European Union, then we have to find ways to help each other. And reinsurance of the unemployment benefit schemes is one possible uh, step. There have been many uh, types of analysis, simulations, mathematically, um, supporting the case for uh, the very clear economic, financial and also social benefits of such uh, a, a tool. 
Mm -hmm. And let's not just mention there needs to be solidarity in the system. Jakob, if I can uh, come to you, there have been recent proposals, uh, German Franco uh, uh, proposals for a fiscal capacity that uh, Maria has mentioned. So what is your assessment of, of these ideas for a Eurozone budget? Well, first of all, I'm absolutely delighted that we have finally movement on this. It was blocked for many, many years. And while, of course, uh, it always, in Europe, it doesn't take two to tango, it takes in the Euro Area 19 to tango, one, perhaps the most important reason was that we were blocked in Germany. Um, and I'm extremely grateful that Olaf Scholz, the Social Democratic Minister of Finance, who's been in office for less than a year, has managed to unblock this. This is a huge step. That doesn't mean we've solved all problems. And that doesn't mean we necessarily already have the lineup of all the different elements of a fiscal capacity, because often people, for symbolic reasons, talk about a euro area budget. But we as parliament, we've actually talked about a euro area fiscal capacity that could very well include a European unemployment reinsurance. And Laszlo Andor is, of course, uh, the godfather of, of, of all these initiatives because, of course, as a commissioner, he was the first uh, to, to, to really push for this. Um, and the reason why, why now I think we need to go for reinsurance is that you, if you want to do insurance, not reinsurance, there is much, much more harmonization that is required. And reinsurance is, is better because it requires less harmonization and also it's a little bit inspired by things that everybody knows like car insurance. When you have car insurance, the first couple of hundred euros of damage, everybody has to pay for himself or herself. And there's a reason for it because it's a good incentive for people to drive carefully. But we don't want to have an incentive that is so big that um, in the end you, you become very poor um, because of an accident. So they don't drive at all. Or, well, yes, um, for ecological reasons, perhaps people drive too much, but that's not the point. I think the point is, um, if you have reinsurance, you can have a national system that needs to be properly designed, and when the hit comes, the national t system, of course, takes the first hit. But when it starts to be overburdened temporarily, then the reinsurance jumps in. By the way, that's something that Olaf Scholz is very much push pushing for also, but there we haven't quite gotten there yet on the basic structure of a euro area budget, we've made important progress in the last couple of weeks in that it is now accepted, and I believe the Eurogroup uh, this week discussed it in that way, that it needs to be part of the EU budget and that there needs to be a sensible governance mechanism, which is always a bit delicate. You know, we have uh, right now still 28 member states in the EU, only 19 in the euro area, so, so there's always a bit of a tension. But I think um, now we have the institutional architecture in place. You know, not everybody is happy and smiling, but uh, everybody is happy and smiling because they know finally we're moving forward. And now it's about working out the details. The devil is in the details, but we are on our way finally to make progress and hopefully be better prepared for the next crisis in, in terms of fiscal capacity. And not only, which is also very important, must not be underestimated in terms of banking union. Because when a crisis hits, two things happen. One is it really destabilizes the banking sector. And the second is uh, potentially it really destabilizes uh, the fiscal side of things and society. Uh, and we need to take care of these side effects. Yeah. I mean, Maria, Jakob has just um, mentioned very recent developments. And your initial comment was, so far the, the, the story of the last 10 years has been too little too late. Mm -hmm. Do you agree that these are sort of signs and steps in the right direction? And, you know, and how much can be done still uh, you know, until the European Parliament election in, in, in May mm -hmm. next year? So is there now a certain dynamism coming up? Yes. No, I completely agree with Klaus, indeed. Uh, when we look to the last years, we see a painful uh, dragging the feet to find a solution. But more recently, and I also shared this with the president of a new minister of finance in Germany, Olaf Schulz, it is becoming possible to open a window of a real solution. And what is on the table now, I think this is a very interesting proposal 
because uh, as uh, Klaus is saying, this okay. assumes a fiscal capacity instrument connected with the European framework, hmm? giving a role to the Commission, to the European Parliament, but also a huge responsibility to the Eurogroup plus the Euro Summit. So it's an interesting construction. And uh, this is recognizing that, yes, we do need the fiscal capacity to address problems of stability, but also of convergence. Hmm? Well, uh, we are still discussing the possibility to move for a European un uh, unemployment reinsurance, which in fact is a, is a very interesting idea. In the meantime, we are discussing a tool to support good projects of investment and uh, the right kind of reforms. Hmm? This is on the table now. Uh, this is building on the recent uh, agreement in Mazenberg. Hmm? Uh, this is building on the recent proposals coming from the European Commission. So all of a sudden we are having a kind of convergence of forces hmm, to pave the way for a first embryo of fiscal capacity. So I consider this uh, clearly positive. Um, and uh, frankly, we should not miss the opportunity over the next months. The European Council in December will be decisive. Hmm? Uh, and we cannot miss this opportunity of uh, having for the first time a coalition of forces pushing in the right direction. Nevertheless, we know that some governments are still resisting. Mm -hmm. We have uh, now a club called Anseatic League hmm, uh, with some countries there. And I will tell you that uh, some countries, if you think about the Baltic countries, hmm, I think uh, they are perhaps making a, a wrong uh, choice because this will be in their interest uh, because they have fragile economies to count on a full-fledged economic and monetary union. All monetary zones in the world, they have a banking union and a fiscal uh, pillar. Hmm? So, I cannot understand why they hesitate about this. This is not in their interest. Well, and yet they do. I mean, uh, Jakob mentioned that it took a long time to unlock uh, the deadlock in, in Germany. And part of the reason in, in sort of the framing in Germany was that, oh, it means basically Germans have to pay for the sins of other people, which is a simplistic framing, but that's especially uh, some of the, uh, one of the arguments that's been pushed forward by right-wing populists. Uh, in your unemployment uh, reinsurance scheme, what level of transfer union is necessary? Right? Um, and how would you react to such criticism that it may, basically means one country needs to pay for the other? Well, solidarity is not a one-way street. It means that um, it's um, actually unpredictable uh, that in the future, in some countries, unemployment might increase for one reason. Uh, for example, oil price shocks. In other countries, because of the repercussions of the Russia uh, sanctions, um, again, there can be a simultaneous uh, economic downturn. So there are many, many unpredictables. And there have been calculations backwards. What would have happened? And for example, Germany also would have been a beneficiary in some time when unemployment was rising in the Schroeder years. Um, uh, some people tend to forget, but there were some periods like this, and I'm sure there will be again a period when unemployment increases in uh, Germany again. Finland um, was it a AAA country, uh, financially quite strong anyhow, um, and an experience in economic downturn more painfully than they expected, and they would also have benefited from uh, an unemployment reinsurance scheme uh, had that existed already. So I think um, uh, people should appreciate that uh, uh, there are ups and downs everywhere. Of course, we have to do our utmost to ensure that unemployment can go down, and we do not not only demand solidarity, but also learn about good examples of others. So we also need to learn the good vocational training. We also need to learn Kurzarbeit if it's possible, but Kurzarbeit, short time work arrangements will not always be possible if um, there is an economic uh, problem. So that's why also some kind of financial safety net 
is also needed in order to ensure that the welfare systems remain uh, functional. This is a social but also economic rationale. Mm -hmm. And, and Jakob, uh, what kind of level of transfer union is necessary and could you maybe use a scheme as, such as the one proposed by Laszlo to incentivize certain policy adoption as well, such as Kurzarbeiter schemes? What is absolutely critical in this debate and for proposals is that in the end the system ensures against shocks, so big changes when unemployment is rising rapidly and not against different levels of unemployment. Yes. Because of course there are countries, it is true, who for decades organize their labor market poorly and therefore unemployment rates are very high. And there is no reason, I cannot explain this to my voters, why should they pay if other countries do not reform their labor market so that unemployment can eventually go down. This is not possible. So we cannot ensure against having a high level of unemployment. What we can ensure against shocks, we can ensure against a situation for a variety of reasons, all of a sudden unemployment goes up a lot. And people need to have confidence in Europe when that happens that not uh, all of a sudden the national unemployment insurance says terribly sorry, we are bankrupt, we can't help you anymore, but that everybody in Europe, every citizen in Europe knows this is something they're insured against, this kind of shock. But then later on, um, it's member states who have the responsibility to get their act together. That's the key thing. And if you do that, if you focus on shocks, if you do not make the mistake to focus on levels, which also creates bad incentives, then this reinsurance system can be fair and it will not be a transfer union. It will be a genuine insurance. It will be a fair deal. And that's what we need to aim for. And if we stick to that principle, it can be really successful. Mm -hmm. And Maria, this yes. seems to be, uh, to be a very critical point. This is an insurance system against shocks, not a policy instrument for convergence. Yeah. Uh, well, on this, let me give you my, my viewpoint. Yes, we do need uh, to have a mechanism to address shocks in the Eurozone, but uh, let's bear in mind that we can have different kinds of sh shocks. A classical kind of shock comes from uh, a change in global markets, and if a country is specialized, let's say, in the wrong kind of sectors, it can be hit by a competitive shock. Mm -hmm. This can happen to all member states of uh, the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. And yes, we do need to have an instrument of uh, solidarity to address this situation. But we can have other kinds of shocks. And we had all over the financial crisis. This was a shock connected with a high level of disturbance in the financial market changing the way and the conditions to finance public spending. When you had a high divergence of spreads, some countries were paying extremely high costs to have a regular financing of their public spending. This is a particular kind of shock hitting Eurozone, because Eurozone is not prepared to address this, to stabilize the cost of financing public spending. And so we should have uh, an instrument to address these shocks. Nevertheless, I'm coming back to the issue of transfer union. Mm -hmm. Because what we have in the single market and monetary zones is a set of transfers in both ways. When Germany is contributing to a solidarity instrument, regarding a country which is hit by the crisis. Yes, there is a transfer. But it's very important to explain to German population that a regular transfer is also taking place whenever other countries buy German goods, German services, or they transfer educated human resources to Germany. This is also a transfer of resources. And so we need to have open mind uh, way to analyze how transfers are taking place. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to explain to German population 
that to count on a large single market, to count on a powerful and sound monetary zone, is a big advantage for German uh, economy and a big advantage for German citizens. So uh, that's why we need to have some basic solidarity. And that's why I think the fiscal capacity in the Eurozone should cope with shocks, but also supporting upward conversions. Mm -hmm. And that's a quite interesting discussion. I mean, what is a shock? What is a transfer? What is convergence? What is an insurance policy? How can you actually disentangle these elements? Yes, I think uh, Marina is absolutely right. There, is, uh, there are already transfers in the European Union, but they are linked to the single market and they have to address structural gaps. It doesn't mean that a country needs to be for eternity a recipient of these transfers, what we call the structural funds, because they are meant to serve upward convergence. Uh, but they, they serve a long-term perspective a long-term horizon. They are programmed for a very long term. And what the EU is missing is the so-called cyclical fund, which would need to respond to short episodes of disturbance. And, uh, and, and, and they uh, would also require not so permanent and not so huge, but still significant. Uh, financial uh, resources. Um, and I think uh, the other point which is important that, yes, it, we should not only think about the external shocks. Some of the shocks uh, can be uh, consequences of regulatory failure or driven by policies of other countries. Let me give you an example. If a country or a country group insists on maintaining current account surpluses, it makes it more difficult for other countries in the Eurozone uh, to reduce deficits and reduce unemployment. And if uh, the, 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 the community finds it hard to, to ask um, a country to bring down the current account surplus, then of course there have, has to be some kind of compensation uh, for those um, uh, whose unemployment uh, remains stubbornly high as a result of this uh, too difficult uh, coordination of economic policies. Jakob, what would you say? As a result of current account uh, imbalances, there needs to be an element or a bigger element of, of transfer union as well? I think we need to be very, very precise in what instrument we need uh, for what kind of situation. And we have an instrument in the European Union which is not linked to our common currency, which are called structural funds, in order to help actually regions, not necessarily countries, but regions that are uh, in, in risk of being left behind to catch up. And that's important. And that's important irrespective of whether you are in the currency union or not, irrespective of whether you have the euro or not. We have another instrument that is important. It's something that I supported very early on. Um, it's called Globalization Adjustment Fund. We have a common trade policy in all of the union, not only in the currency area. And if, for reasons of a trade deal, a factory in one place goes bankrupt, then it is a, a common responsibility to help out. And that's what we do. And this is not linked to the common currency, but this is an element of solidarity which benefits everybody because it helps to have a reasonable trade policy. Mm. You could have, I would be very much in favor of that, a similar instrument for climate policy. We need energy transition. We need it everywhere, irrespective of whether we have a common currency or not. And if you have a region where there's a lot of coal, for example, um, or other um, areas of the economy that are much affected, we should have a shock absorption capacity for the shock of energy transition. Now, when we talk about our common currency, the euro, there is a specific kind of shock. They're asymmetric and symmetric macroeconomic shocks that we need to deal with. And because we are social democrats, we don't deal with them in the abstract. Well, it's a macro shock. Let's move a couple of billions one way or another temporarily. We are social democrats. We need to worry about what does this shock do to people. And the most worrying thing is that people lose their jobs. And that's something where, of course, member states need to take care of those people who lose their jobs. But the euro area needs to help temporarily, because I cannot explain if this goes on for five years, for 10 years, for 15 years, for 20 years. I cannot explain to my voters that this is the responsibility of the common currency. 
as time goes by, this becomes the responsibility of the member state. That why it, by the nature of macroeconomic shocks, these needs to, this needs to be temporary. There are other instruments that are permanent if a region is poor. It needs our support, but that has nothing to do with the common currency. And I think it's extremely important, both for the clarity of the argument and for the ability in Europe to form a consensus between countries that may be a little bit more at the end of paying and countries that may be a little bit more at the end of receiving to make this very, very clear so that everybody can understand and then buy into it. Mm -hmm. And Maria, where do you see the uh, sort of the, the, the mix of policies on the one hand short-term help to deal with shocks, on the other hand um, sort of policy assistance to deal with a long-term uh, convergence program, uh, European responsibility, national responsibility, where would you draw the lines? Exactly. Look, uh, we are now uh, pointing the finger to an extremely important uh, point. Uh, let me start from uh, uh, Jacob's uh, presentation. I fully agree with him that we need to be precise on identifying which is the kind of instrument we need to trigger to address each kind of problem. And he identified a very clear setting of uh, instruments to address different problems. And I completely agree with what he just said. Nevertheless, and this is perhaps my difference here, is the following. I consider there is something specific regarding Eurozone member states when it comes um, implementing good investment projects. What is happening is the following. Some member states have, have uh, just uh, sacrificed very good investment projects because they had no means to implement these projects, particularly uh, projects of public investment. And why? For two reasons. One reason was because they were confronted with a particular shock uh, hitting their conditions to finance public spending during the, the peak of the Eurozone crisis, the spreads were so high that these member states were just sacrificing uh, good investment projects and that, uh, destroying, in fact, a lot of possible jobs. Um, and so these must be addressed. We need to have a Eurozone budget able to address this shock putting uh, really a, a high limit to the capacity to, to invest in the future. And we do need to invest in the future because we need to prepare this transition, uh, make the best of digital revolution and so on. But there is a second reason hindering the capacity for these member states to invest in the future. is the nature of the stability and growth pact and of the fiscal compact. Because I consider this framework as a bias against good strategic investment. This is still marked by ordo liberalism. And as long as this takes place, member states in the Eurozone, they need to count on the Eurozone budget to help them to invest uh, and to do what they can no longer do because they are committed with a strong fiscal discipline. The Portuguese case is very clear. It's a very good example. Yes, we are doing a big effort to uh, reduce deficit, to balance the budget, but because of that, we are sacrificing a lot of good investment projects. So we do need a Eurozone budget to complement what we can no longer do with our national budget. And we are making a, a big effort of reforms and a big effort to engage all the, the, the country. This is considered a positive case, but I can tell you there is a clear limit for our achievement, for our success. We do need to complete uh, the Eurozone with the proper uh, budget. Mm -hmm. And Lasso, we are already running up against the time limit. So if you now look sort of into 2019, uh, where do you see the Eurozone reform policy agenda going and what kind of political coalitions do you think are needed uh, up to the European election and beyond uh, to drive a reform agenda forward? 
Yes, let me start by saying that you know, I come from a non-Eurozone country, but I think it's in the interest of everybody that the single currency works better than in the past because we are not going to be so lucky as in the previous crisis. Europe took uh, an enormous sacrifice, social sacrifice, jobs, uh, investment in the previous crisis in order to hold this together. Um, but um, the conditions that allow this to, to succeed are not there anymore. For example, the political capital is not there. So we have to repair the system because many of the political forces which actually implemented these uh, policies have been consumed by the crisis and they, uh, and, and, they, and they have been replaced by others who is going to be uh, much more impatient. Secondly, this exercise also relied on external support, the International Monetary Fund and the good positive approach of the United States and also the UK through the IMF and more directly in, in policy advice. Uh, we cannot rely on that anymore. I don't need to explain uh, why exactly. And also, we will not be so lucky again with human capital because you know, the, the sharp rise of unemployment resulted in massive emigration from countries like Portugal, Spain, Greece, uh, Ireland and others. And this is a loss for the whole of Europe because they're not simply going to Germany or Sweden, they go to other continents and benefit with their talent, the other continents and their booming economy. So we need to keep Europe productive, but in order to keep Europe productive, uh, we have to repair the system now. We cannot wait until the next fall uh, because the decision making cannot produce all these tools um, in two or three weeks uh, when the crisis is already uh, happening. So we have to prepare, we have to make it more resilient now in the interest of all, including non-Eurozone countries. Mm -hmm. Jakob, fix the roof when the sun is shining. Uh, what would your sort of reform agenda now be into 2019? Well, I think the um, relatively short-term um, objective is to make certain that we um, have a fiscal backstop to banking union. That's a technical point, but it's hugely important if the crisis was to hit us again to make sure that all these promises that we have a protective wall um, in, in the event of a crisis with regards to the um, financial sector is credible. So that is key and it's short-term and it is within reach. It's a deal that is on the table where banks need more credibly bail-inable um, debt and capital, and in return, we will do the fiscal backstop. So that's very short-term. A second, I think, reasonably short-term thing is to make certain that we have some changes to the ESM, that's the rescue fund in case of a crisis architecture, so that it becomes more effective and that uh, what Lazlo is saying becomes true, that we need to spend less political capital and it will be a smoother process in the next crisis. So I think that's within reach. Then uh, we have the question, how about um, dealing with macroeconomic shocks? I think we have a serious discussion on unemployment reinsurance. We now have a serious discussion, finally, on a European budget. And uh, Maria is absolutely right, the question of investment in, in the event of a crisis. But we're not quite there yet. I mean, that's the truth. And this is an area where we need serious political progress in the next couple of weeks. So that, at the very least, we can go into the European election saying, while we may not be entirely there yet, if you vote for parties that form part of the consensus of actually completing monetary union in the sense that it will work throughout the next crisis and you won't have this kind of a bitter conflict between capitals. I mean, it's normal to have a conflict between Brussels, they're the guardians of the rules, and some member states are in trouble. Right now we have Italy in trouble. And yes, Brussels should be firm because that's their job. That's what they're paid to do. But this mustn't escalate into a conflict between, say, Lisbon and Rome or Berlin and Rome. It needs to be conflict between Brussels and Rome and needs to stay there. And so if we go into the election with that kind of agenda, a couple of short-term things, important ones we can do before the election, and a couple of slightly longer-term things that people can vote for at the end of May and have confidence that if they vote for the set of parties supporting this kind of approach, then the problem will be fixed. I think chances of success are pretty good, despite the fact that, that these are hard problems. Yeah. Maria, the final word is yours. Where do we go from here? Well, I completely agree with Jacob. Uh, uh, social Democrats, progressives, 
are the ones able to bridge between different viewpoints. They have the solution on the table. Let's use it now. We cannot miss the opportunity. Final word on Italy. I think that the way to deal with Italy is on one hand to be firm because they want to have a common discipline. This is needed in the Eurozone. But the other part of the solution for the Italian case is to move forward with the reform of the Eurozone because this is also necessary to address the Italian problems. Okay, well, I'm afraid this is all we have time for today. Uh, and over the last 10 years, there has been some progress, especially recently, there has been quite a lot of activity. Um, we, I'm sure we're going to come back to this topic in the next year. But to the panelists, thank you very much. Um, that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you.